Welcome to A Look Ahead. We're delighted that you've decided to join us. We study the Sabbath School lessons as prepared by the Seventh-day Adventist Church, and this particular series is entitled Oneness in Christ, and of course the main theme is unity, and what are the things that disrupt unity, and what, thing, what are the things that help unity. This particular lesson, which is the lesson number seven in that series for November 17 of 2018, is entitled, When Conflicts Arise. And of course, we're looking at the experiences of the early church to see what we might learn from those. As usual, let's begin with a word of prayer. Our kind and wonderful Father, it's a privilege to meet with friends and to talk about you and to think about the implications of these stories that we have read, many of us, for our entire lives. May we gather what truth we can from these Experiences is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Conflicts aren't supposed to arise in a Christian church, are they? It happens. Yes. I mean, aren't we all supposed to be just following an example of Jesus and then we would just all come together and everybody be hunky dory, right? As some have said, the problem with the church is it's full of people. <laughs> yeah, okay. Well, as in another version, that would be the people who say the church is a hospital for sinners and not a club for saints. Um, anyway, we know that there are problems in Christian communities. They, not everybody lives together in complete peace. Um, and of course, you just have to look around the world and see that there are thousands of different Christian communities and you wonder, you know, are we really reading the same Bible? <laughs> Can we have all, all these variations when we're reading the same Bible? Well, what can we learn from those early Christians as they faced various kinds of conflicts? Some of those conflicts arose because of interpersonal uh, prejudices. Some arose because of cultural differences. Others arose because of just out-and-out -out differences of interpretation of Scripture. But uh, let's see what they did with them. In previous lessons, we have talked about the basis for church unity. In order to maintain that Christian unity, we must learn how to deal with differences that will arise. Let's not pretend like they're not going to arise. One of the first major conflicts that arose in the Christian <clears throat> church is spelled out in Acts 6.1. Margaret, I think you have something about that. Some time later, as the number of disciples kept growing, there was a quarrel between the Greek-speaking Jews and the native Jews. The Greek-speaking Jews claimed that their widows were being neglected in the daily distribution of funds. This is from the American Bible, Hoso Bible Society, the Holy Bible, Good News Translation. Thank you. Notice, it's important to notice, that it does not specifically say that there was favoritism, just that some people felt that there was. How often do disputes arise in churches? Not because there's a real problem, but because somebody thinks there's a problem. Well, how do they... said, if you think there is a problem, there is a problem. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> the problem might be, not be where you think it is. The problem <laughs> might be in your own thinking, but yeah, that's true. Carrie, I think you have little, some words about how it was resolved. Yes. I'm reading Acts chapter 6, verses 2 to 6. So the twelve apostles called the whole group of believers together and said, It is not right for us to neglect the preaching of God's word in order to handle finances. So then, brothers and sisters, choose seven men among you who are known to be full of the Holy Spirit and wisdom, and we will put them in charge of this matter. We ourselves then will give our full time to prayer and the work of preaching. The whole group was pleased with the apostles' proposal, so they chose Stephen, a man full of faith in the Holy Spirit, Philip, Prochorus, Nicanor, Timon, Parmenas, and Nicholas, a Gentile from Antioch who had earlier been converted to Judaism. The group presented them to the apostles who prayed and placed their hands on them, again from the Good News Bible. Very good. Well, there's a couple of interesting things that you maybe wouldn't pick up if you hadn't uh, had a little bit of background. First of all, these seven individuals all have either Latin or Greek names. So there's no one that could make a claim that they're going to try to favor 
the Hebrew widows, which was the claim that was the problem, right? Mm -hmm. So they maybe went over bound, overboard almost in, in, in choosing the other side. And that's important to note. The second thing to note is that we think of deacons as people who take up offerings and do other things in the church and help to maintain all sorts of stuff. And we think that uh, the, the missionaries and the apostles and the elders, they, they are the ones who lead out up front. Well, it turns out that in the Greek, diakonia, the Greek word for it, which we have taken in English as deacon, describes not only the work of the seven deacons, but it's also the same word used to describe the work of the apostles. So they were all deacons in early Christian times, just to note that in passing. Well, we know what happened in Acts 7 and 8. Uh, Stephen was arrested. He was arrested because of what? Do you remember from previous lessons? Well, he had been preaching and talking with, with the Jews and trying to persuade them, and they didn't like it. Okay, so he, was, he would go to these synagogues. Remember, we have suggested that um, the experts, the supposed experts, claim that uh, there were as many as 200 synagogues in and around Jerusalem. Not the temple, there was one temple, but these were the small places where people would go to worship uh, on Sabbath. And uh, they would, a uh, synagogue had to have at least 10 families, and it could go up from that. So Stephen was going around to these different synagogues, and he, and he focused on what particular groups? Do you remember? The synagogues from North Africa, that were specializing in people from North Africa, and the synagogues that were specializing in people from Syria and Cilicia. Do we know anybody important that came from Cilicia? Well, I'm going to really. You mean Paul? Someone like Paul? Yeah, someone like mm -hmm. Paul. He came from one of the major cities in Cilicia. So here was, here was Stephen going around spreading the Christian doctrine uh, in these synagogues. And uh, the, the text just plain says nobody could answer him. And that, of course, infuriates some people. Mm -hmm. So he was doing very well until they arrested him. Uh, so it's interesting also to notice that when the disciples were choosing a replacement for Judas, they chose someone who had, quote, been a follower of Jesus almost from the beginning. So that would suggest that this person they chose must have been very much, had experiences very much like the apostles themselves. When they came to chose the deacons, who remember now from a different cultural or linguistic group, they were, quote, of good reputation, full of the Holy Spirit and wisdom. Were there any primarily Greek-speaking men in the, among the disciples? Well, they all spoke in tongues, so they would be able to. Uh, well, yeah. later, but I'm <laughs> <laughs> yeah. No, back in the beginning. Luke. Well, Luke wasn't a disciple, though. No. Oh, Luke okay. was not a disciple. So there was someone, I don't remember who, because uh, it, someone came, people came on the last week and said, we would see Jesus, and they said it in Greek to someone who was a disciple. I don't remember who that was. Well, now remember, they said it to Philip. Yeah. Okay. Uh, and Philip could be a Greek name. In fact, it, was, it is a Greek name. Uh, but we have no evidence that any of the original apostles were of a primarily Greek or Hellenistic background. Jesus so, seems to have spoke Greek yes. in place. Yeah. So, how do they go about choosing these deacons? Well, we read one, just the expression that we have there. Uh, but they, what they did is they called a number of the believers together. And I'm, I'm trying, I try to imagine, you know, I've said this many times, and um, I hope you're all with me on this. I try to imagine myself in this, these situations that we're talking about here. If there are 5,000 church members, and they want to meet together for a business meeting, to decide to pick out some deacons. Where do they do that? And the only place that's big enough that I know about in, in, in Jerusalem in ancient times was in the temple yeah. courtyard. Yeah. So here we are, <laughs> I mean, I, I, it, I, it just seems like that would be where they would have to go to try to do this kind of stuff. I, just trying to imagine doing that right under the noses of the 
Pharisees and the Sadducees. How about in an outdoor field? Well, um, that's possible. There was also a Roman amphitheater, but I don't think they would have gone there either. Do we know that this took place in Jerusalem? Not absolutely, but it was pretty certain because that's where all the, all the activity. We haven't got to the place yet where lots of stuff is going on outside the um, center of everything. In fact, God told, uh, Jesus told the disciples, preach the word first in Jerusalem. And it isn't until later that we actually find that the, well, of course, it was the stoning of Stephen led the very same day to persecution and all of a sudden the people scattered. So whatever happened before that presumably would be yeah. around Jerusalem. Jerusalem. The next major crisis is what we read about in Acts 10. Uh, I'm not going to re read that whole story. This is a familiar story to those of you who are familiar with scripture. The story of Peter down in Caesarea. Where is Caesarea? On the coast. Oops. On the coast, right. He was staying with one Simon the Tanner. And uh, actually, was it? In, I think this is a, yeah, this is, Caesarea is where he went to. He was staying mm -hmm. in Joppa with yeah. one called Simon the Tanner. The event took place in Caesarea, but we're not going to get there yet. We're not there yet. And he saw that sheet come down and three times said, no, God, I, I can't eat any of that stuff. And then he woke up. He went down, and about that time, the Holy Spirit said to him, there are three men coming out there and you, you mustn't reject them. Um, a little Cornelius, a Roman centurion, had received a vision and had seen an angel from God telling him to send those men from Caesarea to Joppa to call for a man named Simon Peter. Now, what do we have going on here? Did Peter have any idea that this was going to happen to him? No. 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 Did, Ces did, <laughs> did, Caesarea, did uh, Cor Cornelius and Caesarea have any idea this was going to happen to him? No. No. So this was an event which was totally originated by the Holy Spirit. And they were both seeking the Holy Spirit. <coughs> yeah, yeah, uh, yeah, absolutely, yeah. Well, Peter knew when he went up, well, you know what happened? He went up there to Caesarea, traveled up along the coast, land, coast with, with the other friends to the beautiful city of Caesarea. If you ever get a chance to visit there, it's beautiful even now, what the ruins, uh, right on the coast. And... Um, he went there and he knew there might be some questions about what he was about to do. And so what did he do? He took some others with him. He took some, <laughs> he took some witnesses with him. Yes. He Not was just some, but six. 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 Yes. six is the number that you needed in court to absolutely prove yes, it. Yes, exactly. Oh. To prove the point. He, he, what caught my attention with it is how Peter felt comfortable enough as a guest to invite three more guests yeah. overnight at yeah. Simon's place. Yeah. That caught my attention. You wondered whether he got permission to do that. I assume he did. Um, I would wonder where town. Simon did his business because you couldn't have all that going on in the smelly house. Yeah, well, and not only that, I mean, we know from the Old Testament that anyone who dealt with dead things, animals or people, was unclean. So here is Peter staying in someone's house is just perpetually unclean. You know, he's already violated some of the Levitical rules, hasn't he? Yeah. Well, it's interesting. I'm just going to note three interesting, very quickly, three verses here. Acts 10, 23 says, Peter invited the men in and persuaded them to spend the night there. The next day he got ready and went with them. Some of the believers from Joppa went along with him. Want to make sure that that's mentioned. And then dropping down to verse 45, the Jewish believers who had come from Joppa with Peter were amazed that God had poured out his gift of the Holy Spirit on the Gentiles also. Very specific what's going on here, isn't it? And then you drop over to chapter 11, verse 12, Peter gets back to Jerusalem. And does he go back to Jerusalem by himself? Nope. Takes no, all no six way. Of them. No, no, he, takes he knows what's going to happen. Yeah. The Spirit told me to go with them without hesitation. So, friends, you're accusing me of doing something terrible, but I did this under the direct direction of the Holy Spirit himself. Okay, anybody want to argue with that? <laughs> you know, these six fellow believers, he turns to them, ja, 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 uh, from Joppa, accompanied me to Caesarea, and we all went into the house of Cornelius. Does it help that, um, to sin if you have other people sinning with you? 
Um, yes. The Holy Spirit more, comes there, apparently. Makes it more acceptable. <laughs> <laughs> makes it more acceptable. But that wasn't the end of the story. That's not the end of the story, of course. No. Peter gets there, and what happens? The first thing that happens is what? Cornelius bows down yes. to him. Yes. Peter says, get up. <laughs> I'm just a human being like you. I mean, imagine this situation. Here's this uneducated Galilean fisherman and a Roman centurion in charge of hundreds of Roman soldiers is bowing down to him. Wow. Anyway, we know that during the first decade uh, or so of the growth of the Christian church, almost all of the, ca the converts were Jewish. To convince those Jews that the gospel needed to be spread also to Gentiles was a major challenge. Jesus himself had made it clear that the gospel was supposed to go to everyone. And Jackie, I think you have some words about that. Matthew 5, 17 to 20. Do not think that I have come to do away with the law of Moses and the teachings of the prophets. I have not come to do away with them, but to make their teachings come true. Remember that as long as heaven and earth last, not the least point nor the smallest detail of the law will be done away with, not until the end of all things. So then, Whoever disobeys even the least important of the commandments and teaches others to do the same will be least in the kingdom of heaven. On the other hand, whoever obeys the law and teaches others to do the same will be great in the kingdom of heaven. I tell you then that you will be able to enter the kingdom of heaven only if you are more faithful than the teachers of the law and the Pharisees in doing what God requires. Wow. So he, he, does two, he says two things in that passage. One, whoever. What does whoever mean? Anyone. Anyone, anyone who believes, anyone, anyone who accepts is. the challenge, right? Anyone. And these any, peop any people, persons, whatever you want to call them, have to be what? More faithful than the scribes and the Pharisees. The Whoa. The teachers of the law. The teachers of the law. I mean, those are supposed to be the samples. Those are the guys who sat on the front row. And in fact, not just on the front row, in the in the sanctuary. I mean, the um, synagogues that the Jews had. There was a row of seats in front facing the audience, and if you were one of the elite, you sat up there, and so everyone could see that you were a saint. So. Jesus is. This is what, uh, Gen or Matthew 5? Matthew 5, yeah. yeah but then you get to Matthew th 23. Yeah. He, he includes the scribes, Pharisees, and hypocrites, yeah. which leaves out practically nobody. <laughs> <laughs> well, at least it's, he's got the theologians and the preachers and the mm. Bible scholars are all, all blumped in there. Well, when it came time for Peter to come back to Jerusalem and uh, go through the formalities, he. Um, I mean, go, go through the, the experience, explain everything to the people back in Jerusalem. What happened? And Dennis, I think you have some words about that. This is Acts 10, 44 to 48. While Peter was still speaking, the Holy Spirit came down on all those who were listening to his message. Can I interrupt for just a second? Now I want you all to tell me what happened. How did all those witnesses, including Peter, know that the Holy Spirit has come down on them. Evidently, they must have had flames coming on top of their heads like oh. they did at the beginning. That certainly is a one possibility. Any other ideas? Well, those that didn't speak his language and spoke something else heard in their language. Okay, another yeah, possibility. Yeah, knew that. You know, I mean, somebody standing next to you and doesn't understand English, you don't know whether he's what is so how yeah. did they have a glow did they <laughs> I don't know I, I'm just anyway go ahead and finish your passage there well if if all the the um, those who were there Peter and the others had the gift of tongues they were I, you know you wonder how that worked you know yeah. if they understood but they understood it as if they were speaking in another other language you know mm -hmm. multilingual people would be able to do that and say well they're not speaking Hebrew here, or well, here's they're speaking Greek or yeah. Arabic. But or verse 46 tells you that, yeah. Yeah. that they heard in their own language, yeah. even at that time. Yeah. yeah, This wasn't the same time as the flames came down on the so people the question, in the room. I'm sorry. Go ahead. 
The question then is, did they receive the same gift of tongues, etc., that the apostles received back in uh, Pentecost? Well, Go ahead. Let's. What the scripture says. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Please read. How much further back was that? How many weeks, months afterward? Years. Yeah. Years. It's years later. Several years. Yeah. Oh. The Jewish believers who had come from Joppa with Peter were amazed <laughs> that God had poured out his gift of the Holy Spirit on the Gentiles also. For they heard them speaking in strange tongues and praising God's greatness. Peter spoke up. These people have received the Holy Spirit just as we also did. Can anyone then stop them from being baptized with water? So we ordered them to be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. Then they asked him to stay with them for a few days. Good news Bible. Okay, now again. Cornelius, where does he come from? He's a Roman. He's a Roman. Yes. So his family would be primarily speaking Latin. 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 So if all of a sudden they're speaking tongues, Peter is speaking to them probably in Greek. We don't know that absolutely. If they're hearing it in Latin, and he's invited all of his other friends in, please come here. So a lot of them were probably people, from, local people from Palestine. They're hearing in Aramaic. Try, try, just try to imagine what's going on here. I don't know if any of you have had the experience of working in a place like some places I used to work in Africa where you have to have two translators. It gets to, <laughs> it gets to be really, it's, you especially wonder when the last translator is taking half again as long to say what you said as you do. And you, I wonder what that guy is saying. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, this was not the case on that occasion, I can tell you. Well, you could. Verse 47 there is fascinating. These people have received the Holy Spirit just as we also did. Mm -hmm. That's what Peter said. So, how did they receive the Spirit? It was by. Tongues of fire tongues coming of, down, and uh, they could speak in all kinds of languages. So, or they that rushing could, sound. so that must be there. how Cornelius yeah. and his family and friends. Rushing the mighty wind? Yeah, mm -hmm. with fire. Mm -hmm. Yeah, wonderful. Well, you, you can imagine it. Not it did not take long at all for the report to go back to Jerusalem. Oh yes. And so what happened, Gordon? Acts eleven twelve through eighteen. The Spirit told me to go with them without hesitation. And we should we should say we're we're, we're saving some time by jumping over. Peter recounts the story. He just tells the story as it happened. And so these are where this is his conclusion. Go ahead. These six fellow believers from Joppa accompanied me to Caesarea, and we all went to the house of Cornelius. He told us how he had seen an angel standing in his house, who said to him, Send someone to Joppa for a man whose full name is Simon Peter. He will speak words to you by which you and all your family will be saved. And when I began to speak, the Holy Spirit came down on them, just as on us at the beginning. Wow. So that's the same as uh, previously. Pentecost, presumably. Mm -hmm. Then I remembered what the Lord had said. John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. It is clear that God gave these Gentiles the same gift that he gave us when we believed in the Lord Jesus Christ. Who was I then to try to stop God? When they heard this, they stopped their criticism and praised God, saying, Then God has given to the Gentiles also the opportunity to repent and live. Okay, so everybody was delighted about this prospect, right? <laughs> as long as these are the only ones that this happens <laughs> yeah. to. <laughs> yeah, right. They were probably in shock, actually. You know, one of the questions I have wondered, okay. these centurions tended not to stay always in the same place. They were sent out by the Roman government, and after some time they would be moved. I mean, we know about the story of Festus and Felix and so forth. Did this centurion ever get sent back to Rome where he might have helped to start the church in Rome? Maybe. We do not know who started the church in Rome. So, I, I'm, I just that's pure speculation. But Peter told them specifically that the Spirit directed him to go to those men who had come to Cornelius. And of course, the angel had gone to Cornelius already. So how do you think the Holy Spirit communicated with these two men on these, on this, these two occasions? 
Well, you think uh, there were, an angel appeared to Cornelius and yeah. obviously spoke specific words because he said, a man called, whose full name is uh, Simon. And Simon this, Peter. Mm -hmm. This verse has been used frequently as proof of the fact that God knows all the details because he said, go to find Simon Peter, he's in the house of so-and-so and such and such a place and this is what kind of work he does. I mean, uh, God knows what's going on. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, do you think the people in the house of Cornelius received the ability to speak in any language wherever they went as they were trying to spread the gospel just as the first apostles at Pentecost did? Ellen White goes on to say that thenceforth Cornelius and his family were messengers for the gospel. Myra? Yes, from Acts of the Apostles, page 139, uh, uh, paragraph 3. The conversion of Cornelius and his house household was but the first fruits of the harvest to be gathered in. From this household, a widespread work of grace was carried on in that heathen city. Okay, so what are, we're, what are we saying here? We're saying these people came, became avid church members, became evangelists. Witnesses for Christ. Witnesses for Christ. Christ. Yeah, exactly. Okay, well... What was the next major step in the process of getting the gospel to the Gentiles? Because, and Luke doesn't hesitate, the very next verse he says, and let me tell you what happened next. Jim? Acts 11, 19 to 24. Some of the believers who were scattered by the persecution which took place when Stephen was killed went as far as Phoenicia, Cyprus, and Antioch, telling the messages, still, excuse me, telling the message to Jews only. But other believers who were from Cyprus and Cyrene, that is Libya, went to Antioch and proclaimed the message to Gentiles also, telling them the good news about the Lord Jesus. The Lord's power was with them, and a great number of people believed and turned to the Lord. The news about this reached the church in Jerusalem, so they sent Barnabas to Antioch. Can I interrupt for just a second? I, I, I always smile when I read this myself or someone reads this passage. Here's Christian missionaries who went from Libya to Syria and the message got to Jerusalem. Imagine that happening in our day. Go ahead. Uh, when he arrived and saw how God had blessed the people, he was glad and urged them all to be faithful and true to the Lord with all their hearts. Barnabas was a good man, full of the Holy Spirit and faith, and many people were brought to the Lord. From the Good News Bible, Acts 11, 19 to 24. So what are, we, what are we seeing happening here? We're seeing someone poking some holes in the dam, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's about to flood. Going viral, as we would say. <laughs> Going viral, yeah, exactly. <laughs> in the language of 2018, right? Going viral, exactly. So just to briefly fill in the story, Barnabas is sent up there to check on things. He's sent from Jerusalem to find out what's going on in Antioch, and what does he find? The gospel is spreading rapidly, and mainly among? Gentiles. Gentiles. Oh dear, what in the world is going on here? And very quickly, Barnabas says what? What did Barnabas do? You remember? He dug right in. and. Help them out. Busy, instead of going up to sort of inspire on them and see what's going on, he just jumped right in and started helping them. And he said, pretty soon, we need some more help. And where did he get to help? Paul. Tarsus, Paul's hometown, is just sort of around the bend in the Mediterranean there, not very far away. So he went over there. We don't know if he traveled by boat or by land, but it's not very far in either case. Went over there and said, Paul, we need you. Come over here. Help us. And thus began a very fruitful combination. Well, um, these people who were scattered at the, per at the persecution after C Stephen's uh, murder, I'll call it that, were scattered, we know, to Samaria, Phoenicia, Cyprus, Antioch, and no doubt many other places. And wherever they went, they spoke of the gospel. And they did it very quickly. They were speaking it openly to people of all cultural backgrounds. Well, 
what do you say? What do you think? Are there any cultural, linguistic, or ethnic barriers that keep us from spreading the gospel? Not like it used to be. Not like it used to be. No. We've got better communication. Okay. Telephones, radios, and all kinds of stuff that I never had. But, uh, Why do you think that? in some places where in the past we thought there was almost no Christian work going on, there is now some of the rapid, most rapid growth of Christianity. Any idea why that might be? Faithfulness of the believers there. Yeah, when, when you look at time, for example, when the Iron Curtain came down, boy, the, the gospel just spread like wildfire for a little while in, in those countries. And now it's happening in some countries which we won't mention, but there are some places where, a number of places now, where it's against the, against the law to get people to, to convince people to change their religion. Yeah. I'll and make an analogy to medicine. Those people in communist countries and other countries were not immunized to the right. wrong gospel uh -huh. and have cross sensitivity, cross immunity to the real gospel. So mm -hmm. they were naive in individuals, mm -hmm. church and we're, naive, Christian naive. What you're saying is that it's a lot easier to learn something new when you don't have to unload a bunch of baggage that you thought before in order to take on the new ideas. It's harder to unlearn things than it is to learn them. There's a, a, a tremendous increase in the demand for mm -hmm. Bibles <coughs> in China and some of those places. You don't read about it, but it's mm -hmm. there. Yep. I get letters from uh, some of these Bible companies and that, and it's all under the lap, and I think a lot of it is they're so sick of this communist stuff yeah. and the brutality, among other things. Yeah. What? <coughs> the Holy Spirit is busy, too. Yeah. I yeah. listened to John Scharfenberg tell about his trip to Africa not mm. long ago. <coughs> And oh, yeah. Muslim believers in yes. Allah are following a brand of Sabbath keeping mm -hmm. and they have a name for it, all because one of their leaders in vision, just like Cornelius saw, mm -hmm. he told us that one day, and he yeah. told another story up in front of the Sanctuary Sabbath School not long ago. Yeah. But boy, there, it still happens. God's Spirit is busy. Yeah. Yep. And he's some of the places where he seems to be most busy now are places where the gospel is almost brand new. People haven't heard it before. I think the number one thing for the gospel to be spread is if hearts are thinking, mm -hmm. searching, wanting, and that, that God need that we all have is mm -hmm. becoming awakened in them. Mm -hmm. No matter where they are, God's going to find a way to get to them. Mm -hmm. The sad part about it is, though, if people are well off financially and their health is good, it's not l really all that logical that they would be looking around for something else. So who are, this, who are responding to truth? It's yeah. probably not the rich folk. Mm -hmm. It's yeah. not the people in power. Well, they still have some needs too, but it's hard. It's a lot well, harder. They to have get, the need, but they don't. Harder to get the to need. them. They, uh, harder to perceive it. Yeah, yeah. Well, so the next thing that happens is the church in Antioch is told by a prophet or a group of prophets, and we don't have time to go into all these details. But there were specific. It specifically says there were prophets in the church at Antioch, and one of those prophets, and it may have been Paul or Barnabas. Maybe they were regarded as prophets. But they were told to set aside Paul and Barnabas to go on this first missionary journey. And they traveled across to Cyprus. And I imagine that one of the reasons why they went first to Cyprus was because that was... Barnabas was from Cyprus. Exactly. Do you think he would be anxious to go back and try to say something to people back in his hometown? Sure, yeah. Why not? And they traveled the full length of that island. And then they traveled across to... Uh, Perga and Pamphylia, and that's where John Mark left, and um, we won't go into the details of that right now. But um, the the result of that thing is they took about two years on that journey. It's you know we sometimes oh hey, they traveled up there and they came back okay that takes two or three weeks. No, they were two or three years on that journey. So some of those things that worked out the the animosity and so forth from Jewish believers etc. 
didn't apparently just happen overnight. It was it took time, some time, or either that, or they spent a lot more time in some of the places than who make. But anyway, we know that it took them one to two years to make this journey. And when they came back, what did they what did they report back in Antioch? The successes that they had had mm -hmm. on their missionary journey. And everybody was delighted, right? Yes. Well, all the church members were supposed to be delighted, but some who wanted to, well, there's a certain group that had some problems. Look at Acts 15, verses 1 and 2. Some men came from Judea to Antioch and started teaching the believers, you cannot be saved unless you are circumcised as the law requires. Paul and Barnabas got into a fierce argument with them about this, so it was decided that Paul and Barnabas and some of the others in Antioch should go to Jerusalem and see the apostles and elders about this matter. So, when they came back and reported, not everybody was happy that somebody was out there baptizing Gentiles, right? Mm -hmm. Well, about this same time, we don't know exactly the timing here, Peter decided he needed to figure out what was, see what was going on up there in Antioch, and he went to Antioch, and what happened? He was fully prepared to cooperate with the Gentiles and eat with them and so forth, right? That For a while for a while. And then what happened? Got some Jewish. Jim Perry, I think this is yours. Galatians 2. <clears throat> but when Peter came to Antioch, I opposed him in public because he was clearly wrong. Before some men who had been sent by James arrived there, Peter had been eating with the Gentile believers and sisters, brothers and sisters. But after these men arrived, he drew back and would not eat with the Gentiles because he was afraid of those who were in favor of circumcising them. The other Jewish brothers and sisters also started acting like cowards along with Peter, and even Barnabas was swept along by their cowardly action. When I saw that they were not walking a straight path in line with the truth of the gospel, I said to Peter in front of them all, you're a Jew, yet you have been living like a Gentile, not like a Jew. How then can you try to force Gentiles to live like Jews? And this was Paul talking, wasn't it? Yeah, exactly. So that's the, the point I want to make. What was Paul's background? Pharisee of the Pharisees. He was a Pharisee of the Pharisees. I mean, this is just amazing. So he had a right to say that. <laughs> he, had a right, he had a right to say that. So this is the Jesus' stepbrother. Mm -hmm in quotes because he really wasn't related at all, but yeah. we'll call him that. He lived in the same house that sent general conference representatives to Antioch. Now be careful. Now be oh, careful. I didn't say that. Okay. <laughs> sent representatives to Antioch yeah. and, and that, that incited some problems. I mean, Peter was the one who had the Cornelius experience. He should have, he, and he got up there and he should have, he saw, uh, apparently initially, what marvelous work was happening there and he was, okay, let's get, get into this. And then some other general conference brethren showed up and what happened? Wow. Peter, what did he do for a living? <laughs> he was originally a fisherman. Uh -huh. And Paul, how did he grow up? Debating, yeah. arguing, mm -hmm. fighting. Yeah. with the people sitting on the front row facing the congregation that were elite of the elite. That's why Paul is such in fervor. He's in his element mm -hmm. in this kind of situation. Yeah. Peter was cowed. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and, and go ahead. You don't think of Peter being a coward, though. <laughs> Not <laughs> coward. Yeah. Cowed. Yeah. As in, yeah, yeah. as in... Peer pressure. Yeah. Peer pressure. Exactly. Old, yeah. ha old habits die hard. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Your whole life. Not too many stood up to Peter. He's <laughs> well, the, the big fisherman. So. And, and I, 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 I'm, I think about these experiences now. We're talking about this big group that's meeting in Jerusalem. And here in this group are a whole bunch of Pharisees, former Pharisees, a whole bunch of former Sadducees, and then a whole bunch of fishermen from Galilee. And they're, they're, are, they're, are they really just sort of intermingling and, re and, and relating to each other on equal, e equal terms. By this time there were even priests that yeah. converted. Exactly. 
Yeah, the Acts six verse seven. You don't need right in the Bible. It says that. Yeah. Yeah. It, it, I don't know that it says specifically that these people from Jerusalem convinced them to draw away. No. It was something about their presence that, mm. and their reluctance uh, to engage the Gentiles that uh, swayed them. So there was, there wasn't a this step, that step. You know. There are many of our Christian friends who believe that Peter was the first pope. Was it all right for Paul to stand up there and condemn him because he was clearly wrong? Well, it makes you wonder about this pope idea, doesn't it? Very quickly, the Jewish believers began to realize that if Paul and Barnabas and others, notice that they, these people are thinking. They're, 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 they're looking at the winds and they realize what's going on here. Uh, if they realize that these guys carry on evangelizing Gentiles with this level of success, it wouldn't be long before there were more Gentiles that were Christians than there were Jews who were Christians. Uh-oh. Uh-oh. Can't have that. Yeah. Well, there's, um, I don't know if I should give an example. Let me just, just give an example, and I won't mention the name and place, and you can see if you figure it out. There's a large island, several islands, a group of islands in the South Pacific, where there was a lot of nat native-born people who lived there, but many years ago, um, the British were doing some work there, and they brought in a lot of people from India to work on the railroads because the local people didn't want to work on the railroads. And lo and behold, now these Indians have brought in more and more Indians and multiplied faster than the local people is. And now it's the place where the foreigners, if I can use the term, <laughs> are more than the natives. What do you do in a case like that? Well, you can see what the church is, is, is facing here. Yeah. Well, as we know from the Old Testament, the Jews had very strict rules about who they should associate with and how. When that terrible conflict arose over this issue, the church at Antioch very wisely chose to send Paul and Barnabas and some others to Jerusalem to consult with the leaders to see what consensus could be reached. And the whole story is in Acts 15, 3 to 29. I'm, I'm not going to take time to read the whole thing, but I'm going to just give you a few final words down there. They had an they a, a extensive meeting. Different people spoke up. Paul and Barnabas talked their side. Peter spoke up. And James, the, the presumed leader of the Christian church in Jerusalem at that point in time, finally said, it is my opinion, verse 19, that we should not trouble the Gentiles who are turning to God. Instead, we should write a letter telling them not to eat any food that is ritually unclean because it has been offered to idols. So this has nothing to do with cholesterol or health or anything like that. We're talking about food that is contaminated, quote unquote, because it has been offered to idols to keep themselves from sexual immorality. Now we could certainly understand why they would want to do that and not to eat any animal that, any animal that has been strangled or any blood. So now the sexual immorality part we can understand. What about the other parts there? If an animal is strangled, it cannot be kosher. That's right. They were not supposed to eat the blood. That's right. Well, they're deferring to the other Jews that might mm -hmm. be around them who would find these practices horrible, you know, if they're, if they're in contact, you know, the... Mm -hmm. the Pharisees who haven't been converted or Sadducees. So, so you you convert some Jews to becoming to become Christians, and there they arrive with all their Jewish ideas, and meanwhile someone else is over here converting Gentiles who come in with their ideas, and then what happens when you have a potluck? Yeah. <laughs> Trouble. Serious. <laughs> Serious. So these rules were there, not so much now the sexual immorality we can all understand. But these rules here were not so much about, okay, this is the way to spread the gospel. This was about, okay, how can we sit together in calm and peace in church? Mm -hmm. And then they wrote this letter, with the apostles and the elders, your brothers send greetings to all our brothers of Gentile birth who live in Antioch, Syria, and Cilicia. Remember those, that's Paul's home. 
We have heard that some who went from our group have troubled and upset you by what they said. They had not, however, received any instruction from us. So what's James saying? I didn't send them with an agenda. We didn't send them up there to do that. And so we have met together and have all agreed to choose some messengers and send them to you. They will go with our dear friends Barnabas and Paul, who have risked their lives in the service of our Lord Jesus Christ. And what had happened to Paul on that first missionary journey? He was stoned. Oh, he was stoned, dragged out dead. of town, and left for dead. Mm -hmm. Yeah. We send you then Judas and Silas, who will tell you in person the same things we are writing. The Holy Spirit and we have agreed not to put any other burden on you besides these necessary rules. And then he repeats the rules. You suppose the Holy Spirit came down on, in fire on those, that occasion and told them not to do that or how to do that? Did the Holy Spirit come down as a form of an angel or a man and tell them verbally? Well, I keep asking myself this question because we call those experiences the early rain, right? And we have a latter rain coming, which is clearly supposed to be larger and more productive and more impressive than the former rain. So how is that going to happen? But we shall see. Yeah. I hope Good so. Yeah. It seems clear from subsequent history that they made a wise decision. Do we always do that well when differences arise in our churches? No. No? I didn't hear anybody say yes. Everybody's saying no. Don't you think the church members in Antioch were praying fervently during the time of the conference was going on in Jerusalem? I suspect they were. Mm -hmm. um, <coughs> did they think about this decision? Did they just say that because they wanted to impress those who read these conclusions, this is what we're doing, or did it, this, this Holy Spirit thing? Or did they receive some direct communi communication from the Holy Spirit? And, of course, the question again is, how would that communication have been given? Well, two or three very important things. How does the Holy Spirit speak to us? I view it as mostly, if not entirely, through the Scripture. Yes. How did the Holy Spirit speak through the Scripture to them to come up with this, oh, th oh, those rules? A whole lot of Scripture which had not yet even been written. Yeah. Yeah, they were all, they were um, depending on the Old Testament for yes. their scripture. Mm -hmm. uh, so exactly. So there had to have been something else. Mm -hmm. Well, two or three very important things came out of that discussion. There are passages in the Old Testament, a couple are mentioned in our, in our Bible study guide, Amos 9, 11 and 12, and Jeremiah 12, 14 to 16, but there are a lot of others, and I would... I would like to go back to Genesis 12, 1 and 2, all the way back to Abraham. The Lord said to Abraham, leave your country, your relatives and your family, so I'm going to go to a land that I'm going to show you. And he dropped down and it says, verse 3, I will bless those who bless you, but I will curse those who curse you, and through you I will bless all the nations. Now, nations is another word for Gentiles. In Greek, there's no difference. You can translate it nations, or you can translate the word Gentiles. So the idea, and there are many places in the Old Testament saying, okay, I'm going to put you here in Palestine, in the crossroads of the world at that point in time. And what am I putting you here for? So you can watch the traffic go by. <laughs> to, tell, to spread, spread the gospel. gospel. Yeah. Spread the gospel. Well, we notice in this meeting as they come to conclusion that who stands up and draws the conclusion? James. James, James the stepbrother of Jesus. This is not <coughs> James, the brother of John's. This is James, the stepbrother of Jesus. Um, not Peter. Not Peter. Yeah. How did that happen? Or Paul. James, the brother of John, had already been beheaded. Yeah, that's correct. How would you like to see a full transcript of that discussion in Jerusalem? Someday we're going to see it in living color. I'm we're sure. We're not going to see it. We're going to hear it. We're going to see it and hear it. <laughs> we're going to feel it. Yeah. Experience it. What else could we learn? Do you think if we if we uh, had the access to that record, would it give us a clearer understanding of how these people? I mean, 
Here's Paul, the educated, the university trained Pharisee, discussing with Peter and you know, and Barnabas from Cyprus, who wasn't even a prim may, may not even have been a Jew. Um, so, but they came to a con conclusion, and that's not easy to do mm -hmm. in a group yeah. in our church. Well, they came to a conclusion that they weren't going to force on the Gentiles yeah. what they believed for themselves. They could keep on doing what they were doing, but they weren't going to force it onto. Mm -hmm. the Gentiles. Yeah, interesting to know how long the meeting lasted. Was it yeah. several days? Oh yeah, it was a while for <laughs> sure. They had okay. to hash it out. Mm -hmm. Well, um, just a, a minute or two, let's, we've got a little bit of time left. Look at Acts 15, 30 to 35. The messengers were sent off and went to Antioch where they gathered the whole group of believers and gave them the letter. When the people read it, they were filled with joy by the message of encouragement. Judas and Silas, who were themselves prophets. Remember, we already mentioned that there were some prophets in, in Antioch. Here are some more prophets. Spoke along. And I just wonder how you qualified to be a prophet in those days. But let us not forget, there were prophets in the New Testament as well as the Old Testament. Spoke a long time with them, giving them courage and strength. After spending some time there, they, went, they were sent off in peace by the, believers, by the believers and went back to those who had sent them. And there's, in some, in some translations, there's a verse 34 that says, but Pilate, Silas came back, stayed, and of course, what happened to him next? Went on the missionary journey. In the next missionary journey, he went out with Paul, didn't he? Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. So, what was the conclusion? Well, not everyone was happy with that particular message, and uh, here's the words from Ellen White. However, some people were not happy, happy about what had happened. Mm -hmm. The council which decided this case was composed of apostles and teachers who had been prominent in raising up the Jewish and Gentile Christian churches with chosen delegates from various places. So this means that someone managed to call people in from different places for these meetings. Elders from Jerusalem and deputies from Antioch were present and the most influential churches were represented. The council moved in accordance with the dictates of enlightened judgment and with the dignity of a church established by the divine will. As a result of their deliberations, they all saw that God himself had answered the question at issue by bestowing upon the Gentiles the Holy Ghost. So, whose story are we thinking about there? Cornelius. Yeah, specifically, but others apparently later too. And they realized that it was their part to follow the guidance of the Spirit. So, uh, are we supposed to lead out and ask the Holy Spirit to follow us, or are we supposed to let the Holy Spirit guide us? Well, the entire body of Christians was not called to vote upon the question. The apostles and elders, men of influence and judgment, framed and issued the decree, which was thereupon generally accepted by the Christian churches. Not all, however, were pleased with the decision. There was a faction of ambitious and self-confident brethren who disagreed with it. These men assume to engage in the work on their own responsibility. We don't have any people like that in our church groups today, do we? Mm -hmm. <laughs> now, why are some people smiling? Hmm. They indulge in much murmuring and fault finding, proposing new plans and seeking to pull down the work of the men whom God had ordained to teach the gospel message. From the first, the church has had some, such obstacles to meet and ever will have till the close of time. That mean pretty soon we're not going to have them anymore? No, they're going to be there until the very end. This is Acts of the Apostles, 196, paragraph 1 to 197, the top of the page. Okay, little survey here. Have you ever known of any conflict which arose in one of our modern Seventh-day Adventist churches in which there, those who lost the vote left the church? or made accusations against those who voted against them? Mm -hmm. Could that happen? Wow. Is it clear in your mind what principles should be followed in dealing with conflicts within the church community? What would happen if we said, we're gonna, we're gonna meet here, we're gonna let everybody express their opinion, and then we're gonna ask the Holy Spirit to guide us in making a decision? Would that be a fair thing to do? Is that what happened when they considered women's ordination? 
Now, you didn't have to mention that, did you? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, good question. And there's a lot of people who have differences of opinion about that. Well, how should we go about seeking the guidance of the Holy Spirit on such occasions? Do you see any pattern in which we have studied, in what we have studied in this lesson regarding how the conflicts were resolved? People had to let go of their long-held positions mm -hmm. on both sides. Are we willing to set aside our personal biases and accept what appears to be the leading of the Holy Spirit when such conflicts arise? Through the centuries, Christian churches had enormous numbers of conflicts arise. We are reminded that Satan is alive and well. And many of those conflicts have been about really important issues. The divinity of Christ, which book should be in the Bible, etc. And there were multiple ones about the nature of Christ, his divinity, etc., etc. I mean, down to, I mean, they sometimes met for multiple years to try to resolve these things. Well, suppose you were on Satan's side in the Great Controversy and you saw all this happening. I mean, I can imagine that he thought when Jesus was in the tomb, maybe we're that close to winning the Great Controversy. The disciples were all locked in a room, upper, that upper room, uh, you know, scared that they were going to be next. It looked, it looked like he was just that close. And bam, look what happens. Pentecost and these other things. and. Try to imagine how you would feel. Well, there are six principles I want to mention just briefly. The, pro the problems were acknowledged openly. Both sides were allowed to say what they wanted to say. It, nothing was covered over. The story's opinions were, 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 were mentioned. The scripture was considered. For instance, at the Jerusalem Council, the leaders considered both the Law of Moses, which talked about circumcision, and the prophets who predicted that there would be Gentile believers. Evidence of the leading of God was both presented and, and, uh, and sought after. Finally, the decision was communicated along with the reasons for the decision. When this could not be done directly by the leaders who had made the decision, a message was sent with an individual trusted by the church. Would those rules be good ones for us to follow today? Yeah. I think yeah. so. I think yeah. they would be great rules for us to follow today. If we were committed to spreading the gospel as they were, what a difference it would make. Our kind and wonderful Father, we thank you for the privilege we have of honoring you by addressing these issues that were so important in ancient times. May we have learned something, and may those who would look in on our discussions learn something from these passages that we have read as our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen.